Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the monthly NNCI webinar. Um, my name is David Gottfried, and I am the Deputy Director of the NNCI Coordinating Office. Um, this month's webinar is devoted to the topic of computation, and uh, in a moment, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Azad Naimi, to introduce today's speaker. Uh, before I do that, uh, just a word about the July webinar, the next webinar, which will be held on July 21st, also at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and this will be on the topic of societal and ethical implications and will be a conversation between uh, David Barubi of NC State University and Andrew Maynard of Arizona State University, uh, moderated by uh, Jamie Wetmore, also of Arizona State. Um, and you can find more information about that. I think it isn't posted yet, but it will be soon on the NNCI events page on the NNCI website, which is nnci.net. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Azad Naimi, a Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Georgia Tech and NNCI Associate Director for Computation. Okay, um, thank you very much, David. Um, welcome everyone to NNCI seminar series. Uh, today we are delighted to have Professor Frank Register as our speaker. Uh, Professor Register is the J. H. Herring Centennial Professor in Engineering at UT Austin. He is an IEEE Fellow and also a Fellow of the American Physical Society. He has uh, published close to 250 refereed journal and conference papers, mainly on understanding and modeling of nanoscale uh, electronic and optoelectronic devices. Uh, in recent years, in addition to advanced transistors, he's also looking into spintronic materials and devices, as well as transport in two-dimensional materials. His talk today, uh, addresses the engine of growth for the semiconductor industry, uh, which is the scaling of CMOS transistors. So in his talk, he will show us how modeling can help us understand the essential physics and technological challenges associated with the scaling of silicon, germanium, and indium uh, gallium arsenide fin fats. So without further ado, I um, turn the podium to Frank. So, Frank, please go ahead. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and begin the talk. So, as I said, uh, is everyone seeing my screen now? Uh, yes, we can see it. Very okay, well. thank you. Being sure, not used to boogieing. Okay, anyway, uh, as noted, I'm going to be talking about MOSFETs because they are basically a driver for industry and sort of a broad interest. But it's, the talk isn't just about MOSFETs per se, but it's about what you can learn through simulation and modeling, why it helps it, uh, to do this kind of thing along with the manufacture and fabrication, which is really, you know, sort of the core of NNCI, uh, the fabrication side of things. Uh, it's work by myself, but really supervising students and postdoctoral students and also working with my colleague, Sanjay Banerjee, who is uh, the head of the NNCI uh, in the University of Texas at Austin. Support for this, some of this work came from Global Foundries earlier, NSF through a graduate fellowship for one of the students involved, the nascent TRC. Uh, for Banerjee, uh, NNCI Center itself for Banerjee and myself, Doctoral School of Engineering Fellowship uh, for Bati. So there, oh, and lots of time on the Texas Advanced Computing Center supercomputers. So I'd like to thank all of the, <laughs> these people. Also, essentially everything I'm going to talk about in, in this paper excuse me, in this talk are presented in these three papers, and I'll put this up at the end if you want to get them, so you don't have to worry about cop copying them down at this second. But so lots and lots and lots of details are in maybe these overly long-winded papers. 
So I'm sort of focused on things that I consider sort of essential here. So basic outline for this is why theory, modeling, and simulation? Why even though your primary thing is on the experimental side, why this can, can help you? Uh, and then a little bit about the essential physics for more and more, because that's the topic I'm list, uh, uh, we'll be focused on in terms of the application. And then about how we adapted modeling tools to deal with this. And then some of the re results that you might not otherwise expect for uh, in-channel FinFEPs. So why theory and modeling? Why do you care? Primary about making things. Um, so, and this is things Drexilla talked about last time. As well, I just want to expand a little bit on it. So from a technology acceleration point of view, you can explore design spaces faster and cheaper than fabricating things. You can also explore design spaces that you could not otherwise explore yet. You simply can't build some of these things. You want to look for directions to go before you commit millions of dollars to the capabilities to build these things, for example. There's also from sort of a how things work, you know, new technology avenues and, and or sort of existing technologies or entirely new technologies. There's another way to look at this, but these are overlapping thoughts. Essentially to observe the unobservable, by that I mean virtually observe things that we can't experimentally observe. It could just mean your group can't experimentally observe them. Uh, it could mean that as a Society, we can't observe them yet. Uh, things, obvious examples of this are full 3D band structures and, and carrier distributions under bias uh, inside bulk materials. Uh, we know a lot about them. We know band gaps. We know whether they're direct or indirect. We can know cyclotron uh, masses near the band edge. We know dielectric constants, but all of that put together still is not enough to know a full 3D band structure of these. And so, for that theory crops in, and all these diagrams we see in textbooks and things are our theory uh, with some empiricism below them often, but not always. Uh, and then uh, carrier distributions within, what's the energy of the carriers? How are they distributed within a band structure? And then explaining the observed. Uh, negative differential resistance in three fives. You apply a big field to it, uh, three fives, and the current doesn't just saturate, but it goes down. Well, you go back to the full 3D band structure and the carriers being transferred to peripheral valleys uh, to figure out why this happens. And then there's to predict the yet ovens or you know, electronic properties of graphene were predicted before they were measured. The very existence of topological insulators was brought up through theory, and then people went looking for the so there's a lot of things in the end that rely on theory and modeling and simulations to make your life easier and open up new possibilities. So honing in on specifically this sort of driver uh, CMOS and pushing CMOS uh, perhaps as far as we can, uh, looking at some of the essential physics that involves specifically for this application. So Essentially, we're getting very small. Uh, many critical dimensions are on the nanometer scale and, and getting smaller. Uh, there's also a lot of complex geometries we want to deal with and, and look at. But essentially, we end up with that nano term again uh, sitting in, in these, and we won't be able to explore these things. So we have to deal with the, the physics of the nano scale. We also have to be able to consider you know, some of these complex geometries. Also, right, so we're in this very small regime. One of the first things that happens is we get a lot of quasi-ballistic transport. In other words, we, we can't just treat things as effusive, but carriers have large mean free paths that become on the scale of the devices themselves, tens of nanometers at, at times, or even even, even larger. So as part of that, the, you lose the concepts of voltage and temperature, uh, not just locally, but in terms of the carrier distribution, they're often far from uh, Fermi distribution. And 
voltage is essentially the, the Fermi level weighted by minus E, uh, and temperature is the how broad the curve is. And once you lose the Fermi distribution, you lose these concepts as locally reliable concepts. And thus, sort of as is drift diffusion or hydrodynamic simulations become pro problematic. Now you can always parameterize these things. I'll get close, start close, and parameterize these things, use them. Uh, but if you're trying to use the same drift diffusion simulator to do impact ionization on one end and take the same stuff and go down and do a short channel MOSFET, there's not just input and parameters, but there's fundamental concepts that change in the way you have to do things down low. Okay. And then beyond ballistic, there's a whole bunch of quantum things. Now, MOSFETs are primarily classical devices conceptually. In other words, you can qualitatively understand the essential operating procedure of these without relying on quantum mechanics, but there's a lot of things in them that do depend on quantum mechanics to get stuff right. And most evidently, this is sort of normal to the direction of current flow. I'm not saying there isn't any of the other, but most evidently, this is direction normal to current flow. Well, one of these is essentially pushing carriers away from the inter interface. This alone sort of reduces the gate capacitance, for, for example. But this, uh, if you, this is just a classical sort of simulation. Uh, when you can see the carriers distributed around the edge, and this I think was still six nanometers, but still the carriers were distributed around the edge. This was probably indium gallium arsenide because there's a very strong peaking of the carrier distribution in the center here due to quantum confinement. But it's more than that. So different valleys have different effective masses. So the effects of quantum confinement are different on those. And so if you're looking at bulk silicon on a 100 surface, this is for planar devices. You don't even need FinFETs for this sort of thing. This is for planar devices. And one of the things that happens in, in these is as the quantum confinement uh, sort of breaks the transport into subbands, uh, it, it makes that break larger uh, for the valleys oriented uh, in the plane of the surface than the ones oriented normal to the surface. The net effect of that is to break the degeneracy between these valleys. And fortunately, it tends to put most of the carriers in the valleys that have the lowest effective mass along the transport direction, so you end up with higher thermal velocities. But another thing that goes with this is one of the reasons we do strain, for example, is to break this degeneracy and put the carriers in the valleys we want them in. But now quantum confinement is already doing part of that. So the benefits of strain are reduced by the sort of pre-quantum confined effects. And then when you start looking at some of these high mobility materials like three fives, has just the opposite effect. You want all the carriers in the gamma valley, but the effects, the quantum confinement, are to reduce the inner valley separation and make the peripheral valleys that you don't want to be in more available to the carriers. And then there's surface roughness scattering. Uh, from a classical perspective, you would expect that if you have a big box, things are going to reflect off the surface of this rough surface. You're going to have unequal angle uh, scattering off the surface. As the, you reduce the width of the box, the carriers say you have the width of the box, carriers are going to run into size twice as often and you're going to get uh, twice as much surface roughness scattering. But in practice, it really doesn't work that way. If you look back to simply infinite, like an infinite triangular well, the surface roughness scattering goes as the bound state energy to the third. And if you look at that and translate it to the effective field, it ends up the field at the interface squared. So the surface roughness scattering goes up as the square of the field. Uh, it's even more, uh, in some sense, absurd for an infinite square well. When you get these things tightly confined and you're into the strong 
bonding state with these uh, subbands, uh, the surface roughness scattering goes up as the binding energy to the third, and the binding energy goes up as the well width squared. So you end up with things where the surface roughness scattering is rapidly increasing as the well gets very thin. And these aren't my calculations. They've been around for quite a while. We're just trying to learn to how to deal with these, these things. So as examples of, of this, oh, this is an old paper. Again, I want to point out that the stuff has been around for quite a while, even if not everyone's sort of aware of this. But if you look at in planar SISO2 devices, and, and we worry about surface roughness scattering, sort of the dominant, it's one of the dominant processes. We, we think, okay, we have these things shoved up against the surface, and it's the surface roughness scattering that reduces the mobility. But until you get to a megavolt, per centimeter of electric field, it's actually quantum confined phonon scattering uh, that is reducing, uh, which is a primary cause of reducing the mobility along the surface. Uh, again, we've, we've known this for quite a while. Uh, this is, they were trying to do a Monte Carlo, figuring out how to model the surface roughness scattering properly in this paper. Uh, and before they did that, they did a good treatment of the surface, the quantum confined surface roughness scattering here, which is the, uh, these are the Monte Carlo dots just from doing the simulation, which is, well, an experiment, you really can't separate these up, but in Monte Carlo, you can separate these things up. So this is the observing something you can't really see uh, experimentally through the Monte Carlo simulations, and this is experimental results. Okay, so you see a lot of this is just the quantum confined phonon scattering, which is another effect of uh, this confinement. And another effect of that is when you reduce the intervalley separation, of course, you the onset of this quantum confinement enhanced scattering starts earlier. So there's a lots of effects of quantum confinement has directly on the scattering itself. Another quantum effect, and this isn't quantum confinement, but this is the finite density of states. There's so many, only so many allowed quantum mechanical states you have in a given volume. The number of those depends on uh, the mass of the carriers. The, the lighter the mass, the fewer of, of these you have. It is, it is these states we sort of have to put carriers in. Uh, and so I, I wipe this. Uh, graph from uh, here, here are the authors. I swiped it from just a search of Google, but it is sort of the quintessential example of what's called quantum capacitance. Uh, it's graphene, so the density of states is very, very low in graphene, and it has no gap. So effectively, you always have degenerate statistics. You're always working with Fermi statistics, never with just Boltzmann statistics. And both of these things make this quantum capacitance worse. Uh, so if you look here, basically what the authors were showing, but I've sort of brought it this out a little further and commented on it, this the small regime over here is what you want. This is the electrostatic band bending. This is the field that is screened by the carriers, which then become your transport channel. So this is what you want. This is what you want all your voltage to go to is creating that, those carriers through the, to, to screen out the electric field through the surface. But the voltage consists of the electrostatic contribution, but it also consists of moving the Fermi level up in the band structure. Again, voltage is the Fermi level. So in order to accommodate these charges, you have to move the Fermi level further up in the band structure. And if the density of states is low enough, you get into a situation where most of your applied voltage isn't going to pushing charge on the surface, but rather finding a place in the band structure to put the charge. Okay, so this is uh, quantum capacitance, which is another quantum effect you have to deal with in these small structures. So with that, I want to talk about the modeling tool we use to sort of uh, deal with these and, and why. So first thing I want to note is this is a quantum corrected semi-classical Monte Carlo tool. Uh, my personal background is I've done compact modeling. Uh, 
uh, I've done your theory, I've done quantum transport with scattering you know, and semi-classical Monte Carlo for the purposes here. It sort of, I think, gives the greatest sort of flexibility along with as much rigor as you can shove into it. Certainly there are things for which full negf are, are better and then there's uh, things for which even drift diffusion would sort of sort of be better, but as a whole picture, I think this sort of works better. Uh, so uh, it gives us direct solution of the semi-classical Boltzmann transport equation. You know, once you have to give up uh, drift diffusion, uh, which are moments of the Boltzmann transport equation, uh, then you have to sort of go back to the Boltzmann transport equation itself. And it sort of cons uh, now considers the wave vector K and the position on an equal footing. And, uh, the way I wrote this here about is just another way of writing uh, Boltzmann transport equations sans any magnetic fields, but it shows you uh, the sort of symmetry in, in between real space and K space in here, but it also shows you that uh, you have six dimensions to work with. You have an incredibly messy band structure to work with. You have these scattering things, which in particular are non-local and K space to deal with. Uh, so you have this equation to solve, and when you have high dimensions that are not analytic, you start running the Monte Carlo procedures. So this is going to be a semi classical Monte Carlo procedure for, for this purpose. Uh, the concepts of carrier temperature and voltage are pushed out as boundary conditions. You don't want to worry about them inside, but they're important for injecting carriers out uh, into the simulation region, for example. Uh, Transport can now range from purely diffusive to purely di ballistic already. It can approach purely diffusive and approach purely ballistic. And it's also much easier to shove in a, a wide variety of scattering processes, including the long range polar optical phonon scattering that it is the dominant sort of scattering process, uh, at least in terms of the phonon scattering processes for electrons in 3-5 materials, these high mobility materials that have been looked at as a possible future for, for CMOS. Okay. And then there's still this room for quantum correction, which I'll get to in a moment, but ways of dealing with these things I showed you before uh, in terms of these creating degenerate carrier populations and the various quantum confinement effects. All right, so I'm gonna move on to how we handle these quantum corrections. We have, we've developed some of these over the years. I think we sort of reached a, a fairly solid point a few year, years back on this, but there you how it's uh, done. The first one is the poly blocking, and the poly blocking is what leads to the quantum capacitance, for example. So in Monte Carlo, scattering drives carriers toward equilibrium. So if you don't have po poly blocking in your simulation and you you turn on all the scattering processes in your Monte Carlo simulation, and you don't get back to a Boltzmann distribution, there's something wrong with the way you're doing scattering in your simulation. You need to go back and fix that. Okay, so this, this is how you, get inside a Monte Carlo simulation, that's how you get the, to the equilibrium uh, statistics when you're actually in equilibrium. So scattering drives things toward equilibrium. Poly blocking drives things to the equilibrium to Fermi statistics. Without the poly blocking, you would get back to Boltzmann. But under bias, again, we can't rely on even Fermi statistics. We can't assume we have Fermi dis distributions, that the temperature and the Fermi level are well-defined. So we need the Fermi statistics without assuming a Fermi distribution, although we need to get back to that in the end. So the way that we do that is we simply calculate the occupation probabilities of state based on the number of carriers I have in that state compared to the available states. So looking as a function of position and which valley I'm in and what the energy is, there's a density of states per unit energy per unit volume. I consider a unit energy in the unit volume and see how many carriers I have in that. Take that ratio, make that the occupation probability. And when I go to scatter into that, uh, into energies within that. I'm not, my scattering is not going to take me to a new position, but in the same position, it may take me to another valley, or take me to another energy, and I check those transition rates according to this occupation probability from here. 
of the final state. If I do this correctly, it will per push me to Fermi statistics. And it does that for phonon scattering pretty easily. One of the things we found very quickly though, we're doing an ensemble Monte Carlo and electron-electron scattering doesn't know this. You, you inherently have electron-electron scattering in an ensemble Monte Carlo. The carriers move around, they create little potential peaks, the other carriers scatter off of that. So you, you really can't avoid the electron-electron scattering in an ensemble Monte Carlo unless you do these incredibly long time averages. Uh, so what we did in, but excuse me. So, but that electron scattering again, doesn't know about the occupation probability, so it wants to drive you to the Boltzmann statistics. So when we tried to do this, close the simulation region and just look at the carrier distribution subject to phonon scattering and this electron-electron scattering, uh, this is a 3-5 material, uh, gallium arsenide. Uh, and so basically part of what's going on here is, is we're reaching the, the boundary to the next highest valleys over here. But you can see we have this very, long tail of the distribution and average energy is higher than we expect. Uh, so it's not what you would expect at 300 degrees Kelvin by any means. Uh, and so what we've done is we've used subcarriers, fractional carriers, where you have many carriers each for less charge. Monte Carlo is a way of solving for a continuous function, the occupation probability, but it's a way for just solving for a continuous distribution function. There's nothing conceptually wrong with using subcarriers. Supercarriers have been used before, uh, but what it does here is avoid this sort of classical carrier, carrier scattering that drives us away. So as we use more, a greater number of fractional carriers, a higher proportion of those, we, we approach back to what we expect in, at room temperature. It also, by the way, gives us much better statistics because there's a lot of overhead that doesn't have to move to the individual carriers moving around going on here. So we get better statistics for, the, for our buck as well. All right. Now, this is just to illustrate what's going on. We, we divided stuff by energy and valley and basically just forward and backward going carriers. Uh, uh, so potentially you could get injection efficiencies out of this and things that. And if you look right at the top of the barrier, one of the things you can see for this material system under these conditions, which there's very little coming back out of this. Uh, and by way that in terms of quantum capacitance that effectively halves my density of states already because almost everything is only worried about the forward going states. Uh, but we see very little going back uh, out of this. So this isn't just a shifted Maxwellian Fermi distribution. This is uh, Probably a different thing. And then if you look further down here as you get north, uh, the drain, you have a lot of things coming in from the drain end down here, but you can see this stuff primarily coming from the source side of the things, or at least this chunk of it coming from the source side that's being spread out by scattering. This is again, very, very non-Fermi. So we're confirming the need, not just think of these things as you know a Fermi distribution that becomes hot or shifts the Fermi level or something. We really cannot rely on for statistics in here under bias. Right. And then how do we do get these carriers away from the surface? We use for this purpose, a quantum corrected potential. We do this by valley. It's pretty straightforward conceptually. We just define a quantum corrected potential so that the classical carrier distribution is the same as the quantum mechanical carrier distribution. Uh, actually doing that and making it practical is another thing. We tend to use the sort of Boltzmann limit on, on this, but we've looked at it when Fermi distributions and it still does a pretty pretty good job in the end, the thing you expect to happen with car higher carrier distributions still happen because you're going above this quantum corrected potential. Anyway, uh, so if we do that, we, we manage, and I think this is silicon, shove those carriers away from the interface fairly well. But we do more with that. By the way, this is valley dependent. Uh, so it's, it's, it's breaking the degeneracy and what it does to the carriers is different for different bands. But the other thing, we also figured out how to deal with the scattering rates through the quantum corrected potential within reason. So one of the things that happens with quantum mechanical scattering is that 
if you look at the scattering rates, it basically oscillates about the bulk scattering rate. These are, by the way, this is, these are some limiting cases, a square well, Frangler well, but this was a, a uh, ch channel uh, and we considered collision broadening and everything else and, and this. But if you look at the scattering rates as a function of the expected energy of the carriers uh, relative to the band edge, you get this oscillation about the bulk result. The primary difference in here is where you start the scattering. If you're strongly quantum confined, you don't start back down here, you start up here. So the initial scattering rate is much higher. And so essentially what we did was, sorry, uh, look back at this and say, okay, we're just going to use the bulk scattering rate. It's not perfect, but it's fairly good. Uh, and then we're just going to start it uh, at whatever, how much confinement energy we have. So we scatter the final states according to the energy of the final, final states. But the carrier, and this is the unquantum corrected potential as a function of valley. But then they, all the carriers are raised in energy by the quantum correction. So it shoves us from down here back up here. If we don't do this, we're, we're back down somewhere here and we're drastically underestimating the carrier scattering rates near the bottom, especially if you were in a KT or something at the bottom of the bandage. And uh, finally, uh, we put in the quantum corrected potential and we use that, and again, this is by Valley, but we use that also to represent the surface roughness scattering by simply taking where we had energy before it was to the third, we used the quantum corrected potential for the third. It takes care of these limits. We're here that we'd already looked at. It lets us do things in between. And if you check it and you take wide wells, it will take you back to the classical behavior where indeed well gets half as, or gets twice as wide, you have just half as much quantum confinement scattering. So, just illustrating, you put all of this together and see how different results are doing this. This is uh, bulk equilibrium. This is a classical uh, a Boltzmann distribution. This is a quantum mechanical distribution. Uh, this is the carriers again at the interface. This with the valleys, uh, changing the valley distribution. This is the scattering, all that. I'll come down here and look at this on transport. This was the classical result, classical carriers subject to Boltzmann uh, statistics moving through here and with no surface roughness scattering because surface roughness is part of our quantum correction at this point. Add in poly blocking and the associated quantum capacitance, uh, far fewer carriers in the channel, uh, put in the quantum corrected potentials, what happens is we get a lot of carriers shifting to the peripheral valleys that wouldn't have otherwise been in the peripheral valleys and they don't perform very well. Uh, add in some quantum corrected scattering and then everything's performing less well. And again, add in surface roughness scattering and everything, particularly ones that are most quantum confined in the gamma valley are performing less well. And suddenly your behavior, your life, your expected performance have dropped drastically. So all of these uh, facts are rather important and interact sort of synergistically. So let me take that, that's our model, and talk about uh, simulating fin fats and, and some of the things we see out of this. First thing we did was look at alternate contact geometries. So this is one that gets used a lot when you're doing quantum transport simulations because it's very hard to come up with realistic boundary conditions, and I'm among those that uh, have found it hard to come up with realistic boundary conditions as well as subband Monte Carlo. So these things are great for focusing on what's happening in the channel. They're the best for focusing what's happening and on the channel, but it becomes a little hard when you get past that. Uh, we looked at raised source drain and saddle slot geometries as well because they're very common geometries. These aren't really too much to the scale and they're not perfect with a saddle slot, but essentially this is a, a Excuse me, we'll raise source drain. But this is sort of a 3D view of the saddle slot where we, here's the channel wrapped by the gate oxide, a, a spacer layer, and here's the conduction channel sticking out the ends, and you just wrap metal around the top of that or silicide or what have you. Uh, and then the raised source drain is you just widen the, this out a lot before you wrap the, the metal. 
Uh, we looked at alternate materials when we were first doing this. There was a lot of looking at three fives and silicon. We considered different surface orientations for silicon because when you go from fan flats to channels, you and we're still doing one, one zero channel orientations in the silicon, you change the surface you're dealing with. Uh, and we looked at true multi-valley gallium arsenide with the band separation that's in the, the valley separation that's in the literature. Well, the most common one, let me rephrase that, it's part of the problem, but around 480 milli electron volts. And we also did a gamma valley only version of this. Uh, for one, it helps us explore what's going on uh, what's the effect of the peripheral valleys? If you get rid of them, you can see what's happening. The effect on it is a little better, but also because there's we're, there's still debate on how big this separation is. And also, in some cases, if you're doing ballistic simulations, even if they're available, you can't get to them. Okay, and then we run a lot of simulations. And the only thing I want you to see on this slide is a lot of simulations, a lot of independent simulations. So you need, part of the issue is here is being able to have a simulation tool that you can run a whole lot of independent simulations. And uh, every one of these dots is an independent simulation. And we ran a lot more simulations. Yes. Okay. So, finally starting to look at some of these results. Uh, we looked at the peak transconductance, we looked at the turn on behaviors, we looked at the on current, uh, as well as some of the subthreshold behaviors. I'm going to focus on sort of this on behavior here. Looking at, at that. Uh, so if you look at transconductance, here, you know, how much current do I get to flow through the channel when I change the, the change in the current with a change in the, the gate voltage? If you look at uh, this, the, the gamma valley only indium ga gallium arsenide works incredibly well uh, with the end contact. Even when you go to saddle and race or strain contacts, it's still the best material. Uh, but the problem we found was in the multi valley system uh, that there was a lot of carrier transfer to the peripheral valleys. And we know, excuse me. Uh, we know that in these peripheral valleys, when you start shoving carriers in the peripheral valleys of, say, gallium arsenide, at least, for example, it actually performs worse than silicon. This is the reason for negative differential resistance, is you're shoving those carriers in the peripheral valleys. Right? So if you shove enough of these carriers in the peripheral valley, you're going to get something that works less well uh, than silicon. And we, and we sort of see that in, in this context. Now, and maybe our valley separation is a little off or something, and maybe that's not true, but I'm just talking about the qualitative trend here. Another thing that happens is we look at this turn on voltage, and what I mean by that is industry, there's usually a constant current threshold used. A lot of times, what's serious when we're looking at stuff and it's pretty, there's this extrapolation in the linear regime, which basically means you find the peak across a straight line along the curve. Uh, and this difference in here makes a pretty good measure of how hard it is to turn this thing on, go from off state to on state. And with the indium gallium arsenide uh, uh, gamma valley only, the density of states is extremely low in that valley. And I don't even think we realized this when we were first writing the paper, but the density of states is extremely low in that valley, which means I'm spending a lot of my voltage on moving carriers into the band structure, especially near the bottom of the val ba uh, band structure, where it's particularly <laughs> low density of states. I'm spending a lot of my time moving carriers into the uh, band structure and less of my voltage on actually increasing the number of carriers in my on the channel. So it makes for a, a large, uh, excuse me, a very small quantum capacitance, which means I'm spent, which makes this turn on very slow. And between those two, when I'm done, a little bit coincidentally, I'm sure, uh, but whether we consider multi-valleys or not, we got more or less the same on-state performance out of this uh, for very different reasons, but more or less the same on-state performance sort of quantitatively. And in both cases, the silicon materials are uh, doing better in the saddle and race source drain cases. It's not doing better. Uh, still a little better for the 3.5, 
with end contacts, but once we put in sort of, shall I say this, currently realistic geometries. Uh, if we maybe did better geometries for three fives, maybe we could recover some of this, for example. Uh, but we're currently sort of common geometries. The, the silicon ended up performing uh, better. Uh, and this is a lot due to the ballisticity of what's going on. So you can sort of tell that because if you look at uh, the transconductance and the performance, the silicon devices in the end contact, and all the devices rather, in, in the end contact perform better despite having much less surface area. So let me illustrate that on the next page. You, this is an end contact. Uh, it's width of the channel is your surface area, and this is a saddle contact and a diffusive transport. Uh, these dotted lines are the open boundaries. You've got more contact area is closer to the channel, diffusive transport, the saddle contact, and the raised source drain contact, they just win. But the ballistic limit, and I won't spend the time to go through this, but you can basically transfer this in contact in the, in the pure limit of ballistic transport, flat band at least, into something that looks like this, which is eventually just open all around, including at the end. And you can transform the saddle contact that's open on the sides, but there's an absorbing boundary condition over here. So the difference between these two and the ballistic limit is you lose injection from this end, which means in the pure ballistic limit, the end contact works better. And we're seeing to a little degree that in all the devices over here, which means that transport through the contact is on the ballistic side of things for all the materials, just more so for the gallium arsenide. And in particular, if you look at silicon, the part you're losing is bigger if you have 100 channel orientation. So if you go back and look at that, we even found that that if you look at this here, uh, the 100 was the second one uh, with the end contacts. The 110, excuse me, the, the 100 actually performed a little better uh, than and this one. But when the saddle contacts and the raised source drain, the part we lost. Uh, was fairly significant and now the more so for the, the 100. So the 110 came out and performed the best. Now, we then put in some contact resistivity. The way we did this though is through just reducing the contact transmissivity. So there's no loss of energy here, just carriers reflect off to it. It's anytime you have an interface between materials, you're going to have some of, some of this. Even if you don't have shocky barriers, you're going to have misaligned band structure. There's going to be just a reflection from changing material to material. Uh, for silicon and indium gallium arsenide, it turns out that the transmissivity that corresponds to sort of experimentally measurable specific resistivities of the contact corresponds to about a 0.2. And we looked at these and, well, as you expect, everything drops a little bit if you reduce, increase the, well, excuse me. Uh, yes, increase the contact specific res resistivity. Everything gets a little worse. Uh, it's particularly the case for the 3.5 materials. Um, and this is largely because uh, they're, they're already sort of, Source limited in the sense that they have smaller carrier distributions. Uh, and so it, it's more problematic for them. They, they, they do less well as a reservoir per se. Uh, you also may notice that in this case, the saddle and the race source drain uh, are doing, especially in the GM, are doing a little better. Maybe the saddle overall works a little better, uh, but are doing a little bit better here because. Now carriers are going in there and rattling around a little bit, they have some time to rattle around. So the ballisticity is a little bit less important uh, and your, the saddle and the race source drain contacts are winning again over end. I also want to mention quickly that there's this advantage of, due to the doping, as I'd mentioned, uh, this is simply because we can get more carriers in there to some degree. If you use the same carrier concentration for silicon, it doesn't 
uh, work as well, but we can use more and much worse we'll call it for Indian Galley Marshonite, even if you could put more in, they would go to the peripheral valleys largely. So you don't necessarily still beat silicon when you, if you even could get up to the silicon doping concentrations, which you can't right now. All right. I'm going to finish off talking real quick about uh, the, the scaling. There's a lot of data here, but I just want to know, we considered silicon, we considered the Indian Galley Marcinite systems, and we also threw in germanium uh, by this point. And uh, I want to compare the silicon uh, sort of band structures we, we looked at. And this is the orientation along the channel and in the confinement direction. So you can see the conductivity effective masses that go with thermal velocities and the confinement of masses along this. And when you get through looking at all of this stuff, uh, well, first thing you notice, know, a smaller cross-section uh, means reduced contact transistor. You have to get carriers into this little hole uh, that is the channel or the drain extension, and it's basically like at the bottom of the sink. If you make the hole smaller, it's harder to get stuff in, and you become source limited on this. Next thing to note is it's actually germanium 110 channel that provides the best performance out of this, and uh, in terms of GM, and even a little bit more so in terms of ion, at the smallest scales, uranium-100 is winning. Uh, and it does that whether we're having a perfect transmissivity or this 0 0.2 uh, transmissivity. So there's a lot of motivation for looking specifically at germanium-100 channel orientations. By the way, we it did much less well for germanium-100 channel orientations. The silicon still did better than that. Uh, so it's specifically your germanium 100 channel orientation. But the problem is right now, as you know, that germanium uh, specific resistivities, contact specific resistivities are a lot worse. Than this. They're well over an order of magnitude or worse than this, at least when I wrote, wrote the paper on this. So this is a good motivation for using germanium. Uh, but right now, with what's available with reasonable specific contact resistivities, we end up as we scale it down, we end up with silicon still being the winner. In fact, silicon being somewhat more of the winner over any version of the indium gallium arsenide we could, could use here. The gallium arsenide just, everything sort of goes wrong for it as we make the scales faster. That uh, makes the scaling smaller and smaller, uh, which isn't so bad. And if, if you want to look at the, the details of every single little thing happens here in house, Higher lying valleys come in and help out with the advantage for 110 uh, germanium over 100. You can go to those papers I showed you at the end. But I sort of one of the sort of take home points here is that it's not just about high mobility or even high thermal velocity channel materials. Uh, there's a lot of these very complicated effects that go into play that you have to see. And it's, you know, as much as I work with this stuff, I saw a lot of things in this when, when I finally saw what was going on that I could not have predicted without having done the simulation. And so I'll leave you with that. I thank you for listening. Uh, and if there are any questions, uh, go ahead and throw them out here. And I will leave you with just leaving those references if you, anyone has an interest in jotting them down while I take the questions. Well, for a moment while I take the questions. Now. If All right. I stop sharing my screen. It's going to become a problem. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, this was very interesting. Um, so, for the audience, please uh, type uh, questions in the Q and A box, and I will read them, and uh, we'll, we'll get the answers. Um, so, Hopefully. I started one or two <laughs> questions myself. Um, so. You showed all these corrections to uh, to the traditional way of doing the modeling. Now, the commercial tools that uh, people use for uh, for this kind of simulation, you know, the TCAT tools like the one from Synopsys or Silvaco, which one of the corrections are taken care of in those tools? Which ones uh, are ignored? Okay, so I don't have a full answer to you, but they definitely take have quantum corrections in them. Uh, when they were first doing it, uh, they were quantum corrections that basically removed the carrier distribution. It didn't, it, 
it did not impact the scattering and it did not impact the relative valley occupation, which was very important in this. Now, having said that, I can't say that they haven't done something about those things at, at this point. But at the time we were doing this, they were not available, uh, those tools, except for the real space route distribution. Okay. To the best of my knowledge. Okay, good, good to know. Um, so uh, another question is about, if you could go back to the schematics of these three contacts, um, because I missed um, exactly- Not beautiful the schematics, but okay. <laughs> Wait a second. Oh. One more. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, what was the uh, so this so the difference between the saddle case and race source and drain? Um, would you elaborate? Yeah, it's not very easy to see on this, but essentially, right here, the metal is right on top of, of this. This has the same width as the channel. The metal overlaps right over it. Uh, with the raised source and drain, uh, I should have probably pulled a better image of what it really looks like from the literature, but you expand out on these. And on 100 silicon surface, it actually sort of comes out as this rectangle, but basically it adds a lot of silicon on the side of this. And in the process, when you put metal over it, it adds some more surface area. But the silicon itself comes out and gets broader once you kept, come past the spacer region. And with this simple saddle or the slot, uh, you just lump the metal, the metal or the silicon side right on top of the the channel width. Uh -huh. okay. It didn't, but in, in these simulations, it really, our results didn't depend a whole lot on the difference between the race source drain and the saddle slot. And to the extent they did, I'm not, you know, our models of the saddle slot, for example, in particular, aren't as good as I would like them to be to draw any drastic conclusions between that. I think the bigger difference would be between the end injection that's commonly use uh, as a matter of necessity often convenience versus the, the sort of race or strain or saddle slot collectively. Okay, Good. thank you. So we have a question from the audience. In your device simulation for germanium FinFET, what effective oxide did you select? Are the effective oxide thickness same for all silicon, germanium, and 3,5 uh, FinFETs? Um, and then there's another question. So maybe uh, maybe you can answer this one. Okay. So we basically use the in terms of the dielectric constants, we basically used uh, hafnium oxide of a fixed thickness. I think it was five nanometers uh, for for all of these and all the dielectric properties. We use that as as a control. You know, what you can do experimentally is another thing. The emphasis here was on the physics and, and we kept as many controls as we could. The one, one thing we did change a little bit is for the barrier penetration. We consider that in the quantum confinement. And with silicon, we, we know we're going to have that little silicon interfacial layer, which changes the barrier penetration a little bit. So we took account of that for the silicon, but not for the, the, the hafnium oxide properties for the other materials. Okay, great. So uh, the other question is, when you simulate, what surface RMS roughness did you consider? Excellent question. Uh, so I think the gold standard for RMS roughness, as far as I know, is uh, silicon uh, oxide with 100 surface and everything else is generally pretty worse. There is an exception to that. If you strain silicon, it seems like it actually, there's some papers out there that show that a proper strain, you can actually reduce the silicon surface roughness for strain silicon. But as a practical matter, uh, we just use the surface roughness uh, modeling. We, we calibrated it uh, to say a bulk, long, long, large device uh, for bulk silicon. Once we put everything else in, we calibrated it to a 100 surface on a, a bulk device for silicon, uh, 100 surface. So pretty much everything else is going to have worse surface roughness scattering than that. Uh, but since we don't know it, since it, it, it not just doesn't change the material, but growth conditions, orientations, everything else. Uh, and we put this out, point out in the papers, uh, 
that this is one of the larger unknowns for the other materials. But in these simulations, at least with the surface roughness we did, there was a lot of things that actually had as large or bigger effect that end result than the surface roughness per se as well. Maybe overly answered. <laughs> um, I, Short I answer is we assume a constant. <laughs> Um, so, if any of the questions answers are, uh, you know, you, if you still have more questions, please uh, type them. One quick question um, is: Are there enough experimental data that um, you were able to compare some of the results with uh, those um, experiments, or um, you know, the companies at these small dimensions they don't publish these? Uh, well, yeah. I, I, so, the, the ID characteristics they uh, they publish, but it's the question: Do, do they provide enough uh, facts so that you can uh, yeah. re try well, to? Well, 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 the first when, when we were, were sort of working, no, they weren't providing uh, necessarily, and that was when we were working with companies quite a while back. And then a lot of these things are are at a scale I've seen before, but I will notice that. We're hearing a lot less talk about 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 three fives these these days. Uh, this is this work has been uh, going on for a while, and where and where data was available to stuff again, we sort of used it for for calibration. So a lot of what we're doing here is is, is taking things we know, which was the surface roughness, taking things we knew which or could do pretty good models of, which were the quantum confinement and and the effects of quantum confinement, uh, which are which are fairly readily known on, on scattering. It's not us this, and they've been demonstrated in various systems before, and and panned out and and threw all that into one mash, simulated. So uh, especially at the smaller scales, it's very difficult to have this comparison to experiment. You go back to the beginning where we were sort of using it to go where we couldn't go with experiment. So, um, more questions. Are you making quantum corrections on the electrical potential or the quantum corrections concern only the confinement scattering? The, the quantum corrections are sitting on top of the band, the valley edges as a function of position and the valley edges are sitting on top of the electrostatic potential. So any change to the electrostatic potential changes the band edge, any change to the quantum correction changes the, the effective band edge for, for the carrier motion. Uh, but again, the scattering rate, we still reference that uh, to just the electrostatic potential variation for the reasons I've already discussed. Okay, thank you. So um, no group has been no group has produced low dope germanium layer so far. It's a real problem. Any suggestion what the impurity scattering on device property, or what is the impact of impurity scattering on device parameters? So quite a bit. The scattering rates are pretty large. Having said that, even when we had when we modeled this, right, it's this, this thing, you put in more impurities, but you get more carriers and you get more screening. So we had the benefit of that in these simulations. Uh, we use sort of standard screening models for, for this. And you do find impurity scattering is quite a contribution to this, but we still sort of ended up with quasi-ballistic uh, source and drain to sort of give you a, a feel for that. But if you were to remove the screening aspect of that. In other words, if you just had the impurities and you didn't have the carriers, it would be horrendous situation. So uh, it's if it's actually high doping, it's good. If it's just a lot of impurities that don't come with the, with the carriers, it's, it's bad. Um, all right. Um, we are exactly at 5 p.m. I don't see any more questions. Um, if that's the case, then maybe we can thank uh, our speaker.
And um, if there are more questions or if you, uh, you think of something else, we can always uh, follow up offline. Um, thank you, everyone, for your attention. And again, thank you, Frank, for the excellent talk and, uh, and all the important insight that uh, this work has provided. Thank you. Okay. You know, the biggest one would be the role of modeling and simulation to help the experimental and to help guide that. I think yeah. was the biggest take home mission, not just the details on MOSFETs. Yes. All right, we hear from the okay, thank you. audience that they also say thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And David, I'm thanks. sorry, none came across me during the talk. I didn't see that. <laughs> thanks, everyone. We'll, uh, we'll see you next month. Yes.